ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Please, please have a seat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, I, I want to start by thanking a few folks uh, who've joined us today. Uh, we've got the mayor of Osawatomi. Phil Dudley is here. We have your superintendent, Gary French, in the house. And we have the principal of Osawatomi High, Doug Chisholm. Gary. And I have brought your former governor, who is doing now an outstanding job as Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, is in the house. We love Kathleen. Well, it is great to be back in the state of Texas, uh, oh. <laughs> state of Kansas. I was giving uh, Bill Self a hard time. He was here a while back. And as many of you know, uh, I have roots here. I am, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Obamas of Osawatomie. Actually, I like to say that I got my name from my father, but I got my accent and my values from my mother. They, she was born in Wichita. Her mother grew up in Augusta. Her father was from El Dorado. So my Kansas roots run deep. You know, my grandparents served during World War II. Uh, he was a soldier in Patton's army. She was a worker on a bomber assembly line. And together they shared the optimism of a nation that triumphed over the Great Depression and over fascism. They believed in an America where Hard work paid off, and responsibility was rewarded. And anyone could make it if they tried, no matter who you were, no matter where you came from, no matter how you started out. And these values gave rise to the largest middle class and the strongest economy that the world has ever known. It was here in America that the most productive workers, the most innovative companies turned out the best products on earth. And you know what? Every American shared in that pride and in that success, from those in the executive suites to those in middle management to those on the factory floor. So you could have some confidence that if you gave it your all, you'd take enough home to raise your family and send your kids to school and have your health care covered, put a little away for retirement. And today, we're still home to the world's most productive workers. We're still home to the world's most innovative companies. 
But for most Americans, the basic bargain that made this country great has eroded. Long before the recession hit, hard work stopped paying off for too many people. Fewer and fewer of the folks who contributed to the success of our economy actually benefited from that success. Those at the very top grew wealthier from their incomes and their investments, wealthier than ever before. But everybody else struggled with costs that were growing and paychecks that weren't. And too many families found themselves racking up more and more debt just to keep up. Now, for many years, credit cards and home equity loans papered over this harsh reality. But in 2008, the house of cards collapsed. And we all know the story by now. Mortgages sold to people who couldn't afford them, or even sometimes understand them. Banks and investors allowed to keep packaging the risk and selling it off. Huge bets and huge bonuses made with other people's money on the line. Regulators who were supposed to warn us about the dangers of all this, but looked the other way, or didn't have the authority to look at all. It was wrong. It combined the breathtaking greed of a few with irresponsibility all across the system. And it plunged our economy and the world into a crisis from which we're still fighting to recover. It claimed the jobs and the homes and the basic security of millions of people, innocent, hardworking Americans, who had met their responsibilities, but were still left holding the bag. And ever since, there's been a raging debate over the best way to restore growth and prosperity, restore balance, restore fairness. Throughout the country, it's sparked protests and political movements, from the Tea Party to the people who've been occupying the streets of New York and other cities. It's left Washington in a near constant state of gridlock. It's been the topic of heated and sometimes colorful discussion among the men and women running for president. <laughs> but Osawatomi, this is not just another political debate. This is the defining issue of our time. This is a make or break moment for the middle class and for all those who are fighting to get into the middle class. Because what's at stake is whether this will be a country where working people can earn enough to raise a family, build a modest savings, own a home, secure their retirement. Now, in the midst of this debate, there are some who seem to be suffering from a kind of collective amnesia. After all that's happened, after the worst economic crisis, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, they want to return to the same practices that got us into this mess. In fact, they want to go back to the same policies that stacked the deck against middle class Americans for way too many years. And their philosophy is simple. We are better off when everybody is left to fend for themselves and play by their own rules. I am here to say they are wrong. I'm here in Kansas to reaffirm my deep conviction that we're greater together than we are on our own. I believe that this country succeeds when everyone gets a fair shot, when everyone does their fair share, when everyone plays by the same rules. These 
these aren't democratic values or Republican values. These aren't 1% values or 99% values. They're American values, and we have to reclaim them. You see, this isn't the first time America has faced this choice. At the turn of the last century, when a nation of farmers was transitioning to become the world's industrial giant, we had to decide. Would we settle for a country where most of the new railroads and factories were being controlled by a few giant monopolies that kept prices high and wages low? Would we allow our citizens and even our children to work ungodly hours in conditions that were unsafe and unsanitary? Would we restrict education to the privileged few? Because there were people who thought massive inequality and exploitation of people was just the price you pay for progress. Theodore Roosevelt disagreed. He was the Republican son of a wealthy family. He praised what the titans of industry had done to create jobs and grow the economy. He believed then what we know is true today, that the free market is the greatest force for economic progress in human history. It's led to a prosperity and a standard of living unmatched by the rest of the world. But Roosevelt also knew that the free market has never been a free license to take whatever you can from whomever you can. He understood that the free market only works when there are rules of the road that ensure competition is fair and open and honest. And so he busted up monopolies, forcing those companies to compete for consumers with better services and better prices. And today, they still must. He fought to make sure businesses couldn't profit by exploiting children or selling food or medicine that wasn't safe. And today, they still can't. And in 1910, Teddy Roosevelt came here to Osawatomie. And he laid out his vision for what he called a new nationalism. Our country, he said, means nothing unless it means the triumph of a real democracy of an economic system under which each man shall be guaranteed the opportunity to show the best that there is in him. Now, for this, Roosevelt was called a radical. He was called a socialist. even a communist. <laughs> but today, we are a richer nation and a stronger democracy because of what he fought for in his last campaign, an eight-hour workday and a minimum wage for women, insurance for the unemployed and for the elderly and those with disabilities, political reform, and a progressive income tax. Today, over 100 years later, our economy has gone through another transformation. Over the last few decades, huge advances in technology have allowed businesses to do more with less. And it's made it easier for them to set up shop and hire workers anywhere they want in the world. And many of you know firsthand the painful disruptions this has caused for a lot of Americans. Factories where people thought they would retire suddenly picked up and went overseas, where workers were cheaper. Steel mills that needed 100 or 1,000 employees are now able to do the same work with 100 employees. So layoffs, 
too often became permanent, not just a temporary part of the business cycle. And these changes didn't just affect blue-collar workers. If you were a bank teller or a phone operator or a travel agent, you saw many in your profession replaced by ATMs and the Internet. Today, even higher skilled jobs like accountants and middle management can be outsourced to countries like China or India. And if you're somebody whose job can be done cheaper by a computer or someone in another country, you don't have a lot of leverage with your employer when it comes to asking for better wages or better benefits, especially since fewer Americans today are part of a union. Now, just as there was in Teddy Roosevelt's time, there is a certain crowd in Washington who, for the last few decades, have said, let's respond to this economic challenge with the same old tune. The market will take care of everything, they tell us. If, if we just cut more regulations and cut more taxes, especially for the wealthy, our economy will grow stronger. Sure, they say, there will be winners and losers, but if the winners do really well, then jobs and prosperity will eventually trickle down to everybody else. And, they argue, even if prosperity doesn't trickle down, well, that's the price of liberty. Now, it's a simple theory. And, and we have to admit, it's one that speaks to our rugged individualism and our healthy skepticism of too much government. That's, that's in America's DNA. And that theory fits well on a bumper sticker. <laughs> but here's the problem. It doesn't work. It has never worked. It didn't work when it was tried in the decade before the Great Depression. It's not what led to the incredible post-war booms of the 50s and 60s. And it didn't work when we tried it during the last decade. I mean, understand, it's not as if we haven't tried this theory. Remember in those years, in, in 2001 and 2003, Congress passed two of the most expensive tax cuts for the wealthy in history. And what did it get us? The slowest job growth in half a century. Massive deficits that have made it much harder to pay for the investments that built this country and provided the basic security that helped millions of Americans reach and stay in the middle class. Things like education and infrastructure, science and technology, Medicare and Social Security. Remember that in those same years, thanks to some of the same folks who are now running Congress, we had weak regulation. We had little oversight. And what did it get us? Insurance companies that jacked up people's premiums with impunity and denied care to patients who were sick. Mortgage lenders that tricked families into buying homes they couldn't afford. A financial sector where irresponsibility and lack of basic oversight nearly destroyed our entire economy. We simply cannot return to this brand of your on your own economics if we're serious about rebuilding the middle class in this country. We know that it doesn't result in a strong economy. It results in an economy that invests too little in its people and in its future. We know it doesn't result in a prosperity that trickles down. It results in a prosperity that's enjoyed by fewer and fewer of our citizens. Look at the statistics. 
In the last few decades, the average income of the top 1% has gone up by more than 250% to $1.2 million per year. I'm not talking about millionaires, people who have a million dollars. I'm saying people who make a million dollars every single year. For the top one hundredth of one percent, the average income is now twenty-seven million dollars per year. The typical CEO who used to earn about thirty times more than his or her worker now earns a hundred and ten times more. And yet, over the last decade, the incomes of most Americans have actually fallen by about six percent. Now, this kind of inequality, a level that we haven't seen since the Great Depression, hurts us all. When middle class families can no longer afford to buy the goods and services that businesses are selling, when people are slipping out of the middle class, it drags down the entire economy from top to bottom. America was built on the idea of broad based prosperity, of strong consumers all across the country. That's why a CEO like Henry Ford made it his mission to pay his workers enough so that they could buy the cars he made. It's also why a recent study showed that countries with less inequality tend to have stronger and steadier economic growth over the long run. Inequality also distorts our democracy. It gives an outsized voice to the few who can afford high-priced lobbyists and unlimited campaign contributions. And it runs the risk of selling out our democracy to the highest bidder. It leaves everyone else rightly suspicious that the system in Washington is rigged against them, that our elected representatives aren't looking out for the interests of most Americans. But there's an even more fundamental issue at stake. This kind of gaping inequality gives lie to the promise that's at the very heart of America, that this is a place where you can make it if you try. We tell people, we tell our kids that in this country, even if you're born with nothing, work hard and you can get into the middle class. We tell them that your children will have a chance to do even better than you do. That's why immigrants from around the world historically have flocked to our shores. And yet, over the last few decades, the rungs on the ladder of opportunity have grown farther and farther apart. And the middle class has shrunk. You know, a few years after World War II, a child who was born into poverty had a slightly better than 50-50 chance of becoming middle class as an adult. By 1980, that chance had fallen to around 40%. And if the trend of rising inequality over the last few decades continues, it's estimated that a child born today will only have a one in three chance of making it to the middle class, 33 percent. It's heartbreaking enough that there are millions of working families in this country who are now forced to take their children to food banks for a decent meal. But the idea that those children might not have a chance to climb out of that situation and back into the middle class no matter how hard they work, that's inexcusable. It is wrong. It flies in the face of everything that we stand for.
Now, fortunately, that's not a future that we have to accept. Because there's another view about how we build a strong middle class in this country, a view that's truer to our history, a vision that's been embraced in the past by people of both parties for more than 200 years. It's not a view that we should somehow turn back technology or put up walls around America. It's not a view that says we should punish profit or success or pretend that government knows how to fix all of society's problems. It is a view that says, in America, we are greater together. When everyone engages in fair play and everybody gets a fair shot and everybody does their fair share. So what does that mean for restoring middle-class security in today's economy? Well, it starts by making sure that everyone in America gets a fair shot at success. The truth is, we'll never be able to compete with other countries when it comes to who's best at letting their businesses pay the lowest wages, who's best at busting unions, who's best at letting companies pollute as much as they want. That's a race to the bottom that we can't win. And we shouldn't want to win that race. Those countries don't have a strong middle class. They don't have our standard of living. The race we want to win, the race we can win, is a race to the top. The race for good jobs that pay well and offer middle-class security. Businesses will create those jobs in countries with the highest skilled, highest educated workers, the most advanced transportation and communication, the strongest commitment to research and technology. The world is shifting to an innovation economy. And nobody does innovation better than America. Nobody does it better. No one has better colleges. Nobody has better universities. Nobody has a greater diversity of talent and ingenuity. No one's workers or entrepreneurs are more driven or more daring. The things that have always been our strengths match up perfectly with the demands of the moment. But we need to meet the moment. We've got to up our game. We need to remember that we can only do that together. It starts by making education a national mission. A national mission. Government and businesses, parents and citizens. In this economy, a higher education is the surest route to the middle class. The unemployment rate for Americans with a college degree or more is about half the national average. And their incomes are twice as high as those who don't have a high school diploma. Which means we shouldn't be laying off good teachers right now. We should be hiring them. We shouldn't be expecting less of our schools. We should be demanding more. We, we shouldn't be making it harder to afford college. We should be a country where everyone has a chance to go and doesn't rack up $100,000 of debt just because they went. <laughs> 